blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by a lot, according to the custom of priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town called Gal in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Let's stand. O oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in Still, the 
dear Christ intercede. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be Jesus ready stands to save you, full of parting love for all. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no Father, thank you for the announcement the angel made. Thank you for the way in which the angel made the announcement. And right now, more than anything, thank you for the kind of people to whom the announcement was made, people like us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank Jamie and Jessica and Lisa for their reading this morning, and thank you for being the kind of church where it's okay if unexpected things happen. Last week, we noticed that there are some unexpected relatives in Jesus' family tree. You have your embarrassing relatives. Your relatives have theirs, and Jesus had his. And that's good news. If the only people listed in Jesus' genealogy are people who carried impressive names, names that had the aura of tradition and importance about them, names of kings and nobles and heroes, we might well conclude that he is indeed a king, just not mine. But when we realize that there are some very unlikely people in his ancestry, we are prepared for the truth that there may be room for some very unlikely people in his lineage, people like you, people like me. That's unexpected. 
But that's good news. And that's not the only unexpected thing about the coming of Christ into the world. For example, you would expect news that important to first be delivered to the most important people. Caesar Augustus was the most powerful man on the planet at the time, in control of much of the world from his palace in Rome, but the word of the Lord and this important news did not reach him first. It's unexpected. Herod was king of Judea, was not the first to receive the news, nor was Quirinius, the governor of Syria, nor not even Caiaphas, the high priest in Jerusalem. The word of the Lord, this important news, came first to a teenaged girl named Mary and her carpenter fiancé, Joseph. It came to Zechariah, a low-level Jewish priest, serving his rotation in the temple, and to Elizabeth, his old wife, waiting at home. And some scraggly-looking shepherds who are as anonymous now as they were then, they were among the first to receive the news. The news that the Savior had been born was first announced to an unimpressive company, assuring the least of us that all of us are elected for this good news. Or as the angel put it in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. To whom was the Savior born? To the guy who repairs your car. The guy with the grease ground into the grooves of his fingertips. The one who wears that, that blue uniform shirt with the name on the pocket. Jesus was born to him. Like the shepherds, the guy who works at the garage wears the smells and stains of his livelihood. He has the kind of job that requires him to take a shower after work, not before. And like men who used to sit under, under starry skies at night around campfires, listening for a stirring among their sheep, I'm going to wager that your mechanic has probably told some stories that you can't tell at church. There are those who do. But my guess is most mechanics today, like most shepherds then, don't get too fired up about spending a weekend morning in a religious setting. They look for more recreational ways to spend their Saturdays and Sundays so that come Monday they can crawl back under our cars and keep them and us running. But Jesus was born to your mechanic. And to whom else? Jesus was born to the guy who drives that beat-up old van with a ladder rope to the top and a dozen stained styrofoam cups in the dash, the guy who subcontracts for the developer who built your house. His name might be Joe or Jose or Jesus. His English might be dripping with southern drawl or a south-of-the-border accent, but either way, he's got a real hard look about him, a look that says he spent one too many hot summer days driving, shingle, driving nails into shingles on a steep roof or tossing scrap lumber into burn barrels on cold winter mornings to warm his hands so he can finish the banister that curves up the steps to the house he's working on. Jesus was born to him like the woodworker who led Mary into Bethlehem and awkwardly held a crying baby in his calloused hands. The construction worker in the van knows more about the tools of a carpenter than the, than the $20 terms of a theologian. He knows all the words to all the songs by Merle Haggard or Vicente Fernandez, and he sings them while he works. Put him in a church pew on a Sunday morning and he'll sit there stiff as a green two by four, but Jesus was born to the guy who built your house. And to whom else? The waitress who will serve you lunch in a little while. Like a, like a mechanic, she wears a name tag too. Hers might be Mary or Maria. And she could be old enough to be your mother 
or young enough to be your daughter. Either way, she might remind you of, uh, of old Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, or the teenaged girl through whom God chose to bring his son into the world. Old or young, she's going to be hoping that all the people who went to church this morning heard something that will open their hearts to leave a little more on the table than usual. Jesus was born to her. But it wasn't just to those who work in the garages or on the construction sites that Jesus was born. And it wasn't just to the waitress who keeps your coffee hot or your tea glass filled and wonders what the tip will be. Jesus was born to the banker who holds your mortgage. He was born to the attorney who closed the deal. He was born to the doctor who counts your cholesterol and to the dentist who wants you to floss. He was born to the teacher who hugs your child before she boards the bus in the afternoons. He was born to the police officer who lurks in your rearview mirror, keeping you honest and alive on 565. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people, the rich and the poor. The weak and the powerful, the black, the brown, and the white. The news is for all of us. A carpenter named Joseph and a king named Herod. Shepherds and Caesars. Construction workers and cardiologists. Roofers and rocket scientists. Every single one of us needs to hear the news that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And the truth is, that might make us a little uncomfortable. Because we find ourselves in some less than impressive company. Every person I know, including the one I know best, me, determines at least in part his or her identity by thinking about people we are not like. A lot of folks who live in nice middle-class subdivisions like to think that we are not like people who build middle-class subdivisions. And a lot of folks who drive golf carts along well-manicured fairways like to think that we are not like people who drive John Deere mowers to keep those same fairways well-manicured. And just as many of the builders and mowers and mechanics pride themselves on not being anything at all like the people who buy what they build or play on what they mow or drive what they repair. We all figure out who we are by figuring out who we are not. But the angel announced that we are all in the same category. He, 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 he defines one way in which we are all like everybody else, and everybody else is just like you and me. We are all in need of the Savior. That's not the only time in the Bible that point is made. In Romans chapter 3, it's not an angel from heaven, it's an apostle from Jesus, Paul, who said, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The right, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, all. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ, or by Christ Jesus. There's no difference. No difference between Jew and Gentile, or mechanic and Mercedes driver. No difference between the carpenter who builds the house and the banker who finances it. No difference between the waiter who serves the table or the patron who waits. No difference even between those who celebrated Trump's victories and, victory and those who mourned it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all of us are in need of the Savior who was born in Bethlehem. Sin is the great equalizer. Our sin makes us all the same. 
And no matter how talented or intelligent or gifted with resources we are, we are completely incapable of doing anything to change our status before God. We may, we may be able to think great thoughts or say great words or do great things or amass great fortunes. We may have mastered the workings of the internal combustion engine or using nothing but a slide rule. We, we might be able to calculate the amount of thrust required to escape Earth's gravitational pull. We might even be able to hang a sheet of wallpaper so that the seams are invisible and the edges are square. But no matter how much we can do, no matter how much we know, no matter how many things we have accomplished, we still need someone to make us all spiritually whole and healthy again. We need the Savior. People who think of themselves as independent, autonomous, and capable generally don't like being told we need a Savior. But that's what the angel said. Listen again to Paul. This time from the book of Titus, chapter 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Now, listen to this part. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Does that sound relevant right now? In our country, doesn't it feel like that half the country is hated and the other half is hating? That none of that sounds surprising. None of what Paul has written there in Titus chapter 3 sounds surprising. We have known people, those verses describe. The truth is, we have been the people those verses describe. Here's the unexpected part, verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Our Savior appeared. And for whom? A couple of verses earlier, back in chapter 2, Paul said, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all, which is Paul's way of saying, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And that bit of unexpected news changes everything for everybody. Because if Jesus is his Savior, the mechanic no longer needs to spend Friday and Saturday night trying to find joy by numbing his pain. And the banker no longer needs to feed his greed to secure his future. If Jesus is her Savior, the waitress no longer needs to front an angry disposition to protect herself, and the patron no longer needs to belittle his server to feel important. If Jesus is his Savior, the salesman no longer needs to sacrifice his family to build a kingdom for himself. The single millennial no longer needs to sacrifice her morals in order to feel loved. If Jesus is her Savior, the socially gifted student can sit at a lunch table with the kid who doesn't have a group, and the athlete can befriend the kid who will never make the team, and the kid who struggles academically can find his confidence in God's grading scale. Now, each of these people, each of us, all of us, can rest easy knowing that we are known and loved by God because the angel brought good news. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Of course, the story does not end in the little town of Bethlehem. That story wound its way through hundreds of places and made a most important stop in the big city of Jerusalem. 
and there the Savior was condemned by the very people he came to save, and they nailed him to a cross, and he died there, and he was buried. It's not this holiday, but three days later, he rose from the dead and unexpectedly offered forgiveness of sins and freedom from guilt. In a moment, Brian Flynn is going to come and lead us in a prayer for the bread and then in a prayer for the cup. We'll sing first. We'll have those prayers before we take communion together. If you're a guest this morning, you are welcome to share in this ritual with us however you feel led to do so. This is a time where all are welcome, the weak and the wealthy, the poor and the privileged, the hurting, the happy. Not a single one of us has earned the right to sit at the Lord's table because that right is not earned. It is given, not because of what we do for the Lord, but because of what the Lord has done for us. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings that you give us. But now, thank you for the ultimate blessing, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him to die on our behalf for all of our sins. 
the sins we've already committed, the sins we'll commit today, the sins we'll commit in the future. Help us take this bread that represents his body. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Join me as we pray for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, help us to take this cup that represents the blood that was shed by Jesus on behalf of all of us. Help us to partake it in a manner worthy of his great sacrifice. We pray this in his holy name. Amen.
Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. Who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us free? take our offering right now while I share some family news with you. And here's the thing that I think we don't uh, often say, but I think it's absolutely the truth. Our giving is absolutely an act of worship. When we put a check or cash in the, in the plate or in the, the way we do it at our house, we, um, we do it electronically. Uh, it's, a, it's an act of defiance. We're saying, Lord, you are more important to us than whatever this money could purchase we trust you more than we trust this. It's a very uh, culturally uh, disruptive kind of thing to do, and that's, that's the essence of worship. So that's what we're going to do right now while, we're, while I share some family news with you. You uh, may have noticed on the, the back wall uh, as you're going out those doors and then downstairs as well, some little cards clipped up with some clothespins, uh, Christmas bears. Uh, that's a thing that we do every year. We take up um, uh, for Child Haven. It's a, a, a Christian children's home in this area. Uh, you can take one of those, purchase a $25 gift certificate, write a note in the card, and bring it back to us by next Sunday. We'll make write a check. Write a check. We'll come, we buy the cards. Oh, you write a check, and then we'll, we'll buy the cards. Thank you, Lincoln. Uh, so make that check out to Jody Vickery. Uh, 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 kidding, kidding. Make it out to Child Haven or, or Twickenham. Twickenham, okay, make it out Twickenham, and we'll we'll buy the purchase the t- the gift cards all in one batch and save some money that way and be able to give more. Uh, the Christmas play is coming up next Friday and Saturday uh, at seven o'clock on both nights. Tickets are available. I'm going to think I'm going to say those are downstairs now because of our construction going on right here. You need to get one of those tickets uh, soon because they're they're I haven't gotten mine yet, so I've got to get mine. But that's coming up next Friday and Saturday. These folks have been doing a lot of work on this, and I can't wait to, to see this, uh, this, this theatrical presentation 
about Jesus. Uh, we got dessert that's going to be along with that. Uh, it's going to be in the round, so it'll be a very interesting uh, event. and be a great thing for you to bring a friend to. This is a really good thing for you to bring a friend to, share some dessert and coffee, and see some great, a, a great story told about Jesus. Also, coming up real soon, uh, this Wednesday night is our first uh, dinner, uh, d- uh, dessert and Devo for December. We'll do three of them, uh, December 7th, 14th, and 21st. And the theme this year is called History is His Story. And we'll be looking at some moments in, in Christmas history and how the story of Jesus connects with those. We'll be doing some of those in a couple of weeks. I want to give a big shout out to our folks from PAR, Prepare and Respond. They spent some time over the weekend helping some folks around the area recover from storms. So give those guys a hand. Thank you for your work in that. And then one other thing, our new mem- we have a new members luncheon today, after, immediately after this service downstairs in the fellowship hall. If you're a new member, if you're contemplating uh, making Twickenham your church home, join us downstairs for lunch and you'll be able to meet some of the staff, some of the elders, and uh, learn a little bit more about who Twickenham is and what we do and find, finding a place here. Lincoln, can I get you guys to come on back up? Uh, we, we've been talking uh, all morning about the most important announcement that was ever made. So it just seems wrong to end the service with a bunch of announcements that, while important to our church, don't hold a candle to the announcement that the angel made on that special night 2,000 years ago. So instead of just saying, we'll see you next week, we're going to end our service with a time of praise for what the Lord has done for us and what the Lord has done in us. The news that God and sinners have been reconciled is news that ought to be celebrated. Let's stand. Let's sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic hosts proclaim, This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is 
is a failing love. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for. All that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy us. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
his words were things He's the Alpha, Omega, beginning and end He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer and Man He's my Prince of Peace And I will live my life for Him He is Lord of Lords He is King of Kings He is mighty God Lord of everything He's Emmanuel, He's the Great I Am, He's the Prince of Peace, who is the Lamb, He's the Living God, He's my saving grace, He will reign forever, He is Ancient of Days, He's the Alpha, Omega, Beginning and End, He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer and Friend, He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. Come to us, Lord Jesus. Be born in us this day. In our hearts, our minds, our lives, may the light of your life be kindled in us and lead us to the shining truth of God with us, God for us, God in us. Amen. Have a great day.